We've been seeing this, this portion, and I hope it's so indelibly riveted to your mind that long after you've forgotten me, this portion will be marked and underlined, and when you go back to it in your reading, you will be reminded of some of the things that have been said about. Listen carefully. Master, which is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We've seen the, the great commandment as it related to loving God. We've understood that to love in this context means to commit our wills, to seek the blessedness and joy and happiness and satisfaction of God. We've seen the great commandment as it relates to a proper love of self and of our neighbors. We've considered something of the implications of this when we heard Christ say, He that heareth my words and doeth them, he it is that loveth me. If you keep my commandments, then you are my disciples indeed. And we've considered the great call. We've also considered something of the fact that he has made a commitment to us. If you keep my commandments, then you are my disciples indeed. And we've considered the great call. We've also considered something of the fact that he has made a commitment to us. The call was to follow Christ, and in the following of him, as we went into all the world, or as we go into all the world, to preach the gospel, we are to preach the gospel, and Christ has committed himself to us. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Last evening we considered the great confirmation. By what evidence are you, can you satisfy your own heart that you do love God as he has said forth? And we saw in 1 John that if we love his commandments, if we obey his commandments, then we are indeed uh, in love with him. Thus, we come tonight to what would logically be the, the last last aspect of this, and that's the great judgment. Certainly we would expect that if this is such an important commandment, that he could say that on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, that we can fully expect that he would have something to say about the time, the occasion, when we are going to be judged as to whether or not we have loved him with all of our hearts, all of our souls, all of our minds, and we have loved our neighbors as ourselves. In order to get the biblical setting, or at least to understand the principles that are going to be applied in that judgment, turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 25. I think it's just so gracious of the Lord to give to us a preview of that judgment. Tom Hare, who had been ministering in our churches for several months, in fact, two or three years, getting ready to go back to Ireland, Dr. Tozer said, well, Tom, are you, are you going to be doing a lot of preaching when you get home to Ireland? And he said, no, I'm going back to my little village home, and I'm going to shut the door. And he said, I'm going to have a preview of the judgment seat of Christ. I want to find out the worst about myself while there's still time enough to do something about it. Well, I think that's excellent. And I think that it's so gracious of God to give us a preview of the judgment so that we can find out the worst about ourselves while we still have time enough to do something about it. Now, you listen carefully as I read from Matthew 25, at the beginning with the 34th verse. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
for I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee, and or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee, sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it, Unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angel. For I was a hunger, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee as hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in his second letter, and the thirteenth chapter and the fifth verse, saying, Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Christ be in you, except you be reprobate. You see, the Apostle taught, and the Word of God clearly teaches, that salvation is not a decision, though it involves a decision. Salvation is not a system of truth, though it is certainly systematic and true. It is not a selection of scripture verses, though undoubtedly scripture verses set forth the plan of salvation. Salvation is not a decision, it's not a system, it's not scripture verses. It's not a ritual, it's not a right. Salvation is a person. Now I want to repeat that. Salvation is a person. A person. Now, years ago when I was studying Bible school, reading the, uh, studying the Word, I, I came in my course of assignment to Psalm 27. And I was a little bit disturbed by the fact that David seemed to be somewhat ignorant of what correct theology would have made clear had he had the benefit of my training. For instance, there in Psalm 27 you read, Jehovah is my life and my salvation. Now, we all know that the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. But we could have helped David, couldn't we? We could have said, now David, let's get this straight. Jehovah is your life, and he leads you to the gift of salvation. But salvation is pardon from past sin. Salvation is the gift of eternal life. Salvation is being justified by faith. David would have come back to us and said, please, don't disturb me. Don't disturb me. Jehovah is my life and my salvation. 
He is my salvation. Now, the Apostle Paul put it in just a little different way. He said, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we shall be like When Christ, who is our life, he indicated, therefore, that eternal life is a person. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And John said, He that hath the Son hath life. The life. Because life is in the Son. Life is the Son. And again we, we have it that examine yourself, whether you be in the faith, prove your own self, so you not your own self, how that Christ be in you, except to be reprobate. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ in a plan, though a plan is helpful. Not Christ in Scripture, though it's by the Word that we're brought uh, savingly to Him. Not Christ in heaven, though He is there at the right hand of the Father. It's Christ in you the hope of glory, because salvation is a person. Now, in the course of my peregrinations, I've discovered that there are several different kinds of faith. I've located them and shared them. I think I alluded to them earlier. I have found, for instance, that there are those who have what I would call, in respect to this the most important subject in all the world, a head faith. By that, I refer to an intellectual assent to the historicity of the gospel, to the facts of the life of Christ, to his virgin birth, his sinless life, his atoning death, his bodily resurrection, his ascension, his return. And they are intellectually convinced that these things are so, and they are thus saying, I believe that these facts are so, and are inferring from their belief that they're saved. And yet, they would have merely, as important as it is, an intellectual response to the gospel. Now, I think that there may be far more than we realize in that category. Then there's a second company of people, and I, I would say that these have what, what you might call a dead faith. Mainly, they have appropriated all the doctrines I've just spoken about. But in addition to that, they have uh, perhaps been baptized. They may have been catechized. They may have been taken into the membership of the church. They may abstain from eating, drinking certain things. They may abstain from going certain places and doing certain things. And they may do certain precise things. In other words, there are rituals and taboos, rites and ceremonies that they observe. And they would infer from their diligence in these things that they are, that they are uh, Christian. And but of course, we have to look back at a couple of different groups that did this perhaps with even greater excellence. For instance, is the Lord Jesus in Matthew 5, 20 said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, now that isn't hard to, to, to understand, is it? Because he called the scribes and Pharisees whited sepulchers, wolves in sheep clothing, and perhaps they were, but they also had some things on the positive side, and we ought to observe those things. For instance, the Pharisees were fundamental in their theology, as in contrast to the Sadducees. You see, the Pharisees believed in the inspiration of the Torah, the Old Testament. That's what they had. They believed in life after death. They believed in the existence of angels and angelic visitation. They believed in the necessity of observing the law of sacrifices and blood sacrifice. They believed in abstaining from the things God had pro uh, prohibited in terms of diet. So, we would have to say that is in contrast to the Sadducees, 
who didn't believe in inspiration, didn't believe in life after death, didn't believe in the necessity of blood sacrifice, didn't believe in the existence of angels, that the Pharisees were fundamental and orthodox in their theology. And there was something else. They were evangelistic in their zeal. Because it was, uh, they, they were convinced that the only ones that had eternal life were Jews, and therefore they did their best to get Gentiles to convert to Judaism. And they used the ceremony of, an, of, of introduction into Judaism by the way of water baptism that emerged. And so it was that they would talk with the Gentiles that came into their area, and they were successful. So successful that when Herod drew up the plans for the rebuilt temple, he had to put in an enlarged court of the proselytes to take care of the product of the evangelistic zeal of the Pharisees. And there was something else about the Pharisees. They were missionary in their, in their fervor. It was said of them that the Pharisees would encircle the globe to make one proselyte. Wasn't too long a trip anywhere. If at the end there was somebody they could get to convert to, Jew, to Judaism. Well, we've got three things. Is anything wrong with that? Orthodox fundamental theology, evangelistic in zeal, missionary in fervor. Well, let's say something else. But they were premillennial in their hope. That's right. They were looking for the personal bodily return of Messiah to set up the throne of David and give back to Israel the glory she'd had under David. They were anticipating his coming, looking for his coming, talking about his coming, waiting for his coming. Now there's nothing wrong with that. And then there's something else we should add to that. They were devout in their practice. For instance, they fasted two days out of the week. From sunup until sundown, they wouldn't drink water, they wouldn't eat food, they wouldn't even swallow their own spittle. And they did this week in and week out, year in and year out. But it wasn't just fasting two days a week. They prayed three times a day, starting early in the morning and again in the middle of the day and the evening. And the shortest of their prayers, even if they hurried, would be about eight minutes. So that would be at least 24 to half an hour a day spent in prayer. Now there's nothing wrong with that, is there? And they tithed everything they possessed. Every single thing they possessed, they tithed. Oh, even down to the absurd, somebody would pick some mint, you know, for flavoring tea, and they count it out leaf by leaf. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And they changed the mint and the anise. These little uh, things, you know, seeds they use to flavor cookies. They cut them out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. And they, and they even the anise. And the cumin, the money that was so cheap and so only the poorest of the poor used it. But they count it out. Mint, anise, cumin. They tithed everything. Now, here you are. Look at it. Fundamental in theology. Evangelistic in zeal, missionary in fervor, premillennial in their hope, devout in their practice, fasting, praying, tithing, and Christ said, if you don't have more than that, you'll never make it into heaven. But why? Because anyone with intelligence enough to come in out of the rain, Anyone who had normal adult abilities and personality could do all of these things without anything from God. And you see, salvation is not what we do. Salvation is a person who came from heaven and lived and died and rose again from the dead and will, in response to proper faith, come into one's heart. But we've had two kinds of intellectual ascent. That's why Paul said, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. The faith. Not just some kind, not any, just any kind, but the faith. Now, the intellectual ascent's not enough. And, uh, and the, the uh, dead faith and appropriation of rituals and all these other things we've talked about, that's not enough. Now, James talked about a third kind. He said, you say you believe. Okay, that's good. But remember, the devils also believe. What do you do more than they? And they not only believe, but they tremble. 
I call that an emotional response to the place of heaven and the possibility of loss and suffering in hell. And there are those that have been moved in that direction. And so Christ said, examine yourself, whether you be in the faith through the Apostle Paul. Now there's a third, fourth kind of faith. That's the kind Paul talks about in Romans the tenth, tenth chapter. And the ninth and the tenth verse where he said, Thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus to be Lord, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, not just righteousness imputed in justification, but righteousness imparted in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ, our life. Now, it's extremely important for us to understand this. The Apostle said, look, don't wait. It's too important. It's too crucial. Too much is at stake. Make sure. Make certain. Make sure, examine, scrutinize carefully. Weigh, measure, test. Examine yourself, not your neighbor, not your friend, not your family, whether you be in the faith. Prove, weigh, assay, evaluate yourself. Prove your own self. Know you not your own self. How does Christ be in you, except you be set for everything. Now, this is the reason why John Wesley was instrumental of God in bringing back to the, to the lost teaching that had been centuries hidden, namely that, that when Jesus Christ comes to bring life, he tells you, now you say Christ, in his resurrection body, He's at the right hand of the throne on high. Does he come back physically and literally? Oh, not so. You see, the God of the Bible is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, the Father is God. But God is not God only as Father. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Son is God. But God is not God only as Son. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God. But God is not God only as Holy Spirit. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, wherever God is manifest as Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are. And wherever God is manifest as Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are. And wherever God is manifest as Holy Spirit, the Son, and the Father are. This is the end of sign one. Please stop the machine at this point and turn the cassette over. Now don't tell me you understand that. Because if you do, I then am not going to be able to believe anything you talk. And don't feel badly because you don't understand. Because you don't even understand electricity. Did you know that? You don't know what electricity is. A professor in college in physics was lecturing, and there was a sleepy student. And he wanted to get his attention, so he said, Smith, stand up! And the fellow shook himself and stood up. He said, Smith, define electricity. And he scratched his head, and he shaved, shook his chin, and he looked around, and he said, Well, professor, I, for the moment I can't think. And, uh, he said, uh, before class, I knew I'd forgotten. And the professor put his hands to his head and said, Oh, what a tragedy. Just think. Only you and God knew what electricity is, and now you've forgotten. You don't know what it is. Oh, I said that out in Cranford, New Jersey, at the Alliance Church, and a young university chap took me to the train. He said, Oh, I'm so glad none of my college student friends were here. Oh, I said, what did I say? I have open mouth disease, and I never know when I'll get an outbreak. Now, what did I say? He said, uh, you said that nobody knows what electricity is. 
Consequently, we use electricity, we are, we are exposed to it, it's a great servant, it's around us. We don't really know what it is. It hasn't been defined. And so how God can exist in three persons and yet be as he is perfectly one, we do not know. But we know that this is true. We know this is true. Now, in God you live and you move and you have your being. God is not far from every one of us. Actually, we're living in three environments tonight. The first environment is the one with which we're the most familiar. It's air, cool or warm, muggy or dry, as the case may be. But we're, we're familiar with this. We live, walk at the bottom of a sea of air. It extends several miles above us, and it exerts a heavy pressure upon us. And when we go quickly up in an elevator or an airplane, the pressure isn't equalized and our, our ears will hurt as we get toward the top of this sea of air in which we walk and live and move and from which we have our being. Now there's a receiving set that we have by which the air becomes our life. We're sustained by it, and that's the lungs. It's valuable around our body, but if I held your nose and my hands over your lips so the air couldn't get to your lungs, five, six, seven minutes, and you'd be a statistic because you have to have it in just one place in your receiving set that gets the benefit from it. Now there is a second atmosphere around you, and that is electronic sound and impulse. This room is filled with television uh, impulse or, or, or pictures and radio sounds. Why, if we wanted to have all of the sound in this room audible, we'd have to put racks up here and put the put radio and TV and shortwave receivers up in order that we could get it all. You're just surrounded by it. It isn't troubling you, and it's not interfering with what I'm saying, and it doesn't obscure you from my from your vision because you don't have a receiving set. Now there's a third atmosphere, and that third atmosphere is God. And as long as you remain in rebellion against God, indifferent to his love and his grace and his mercy, committed to please yourself as the end of your being, then there will be no communication. Oh, you have a receiving set. Not your lungs, not your eyes or your ears or your intellect, but your spirit. Your spirit. You have all the capacity to know God. Everything that's necessary to know it. But as long as you remain committed to this thing called sin, which is the supreme choice of the life to please yourself without regard for the will of God and the rights of others, God refuses to reveal himself to you. But when you are awakened to the the serious, the, the criminal nature of this, this rebellion against just and proper authority, when you decide that you no longer are wise enough and good enough to rule and control your own life, when you, as it were, like a rebel that's been aiming at, uh, with a gun at the head of God in warfare against him, even though it may not have been open and avowed, it's been a kind of a... Uh, uh, a Viet Cong type of guerrilla warfare with God, you've been, a, you've been his about enemy by virtue of the fact you've been committed to do that which was contrary to his plan and his will, to please yourself without regard for his will or purpose. Now, when you're awakened to this and convinced of the criminal nature of it, and you decide to change your mind from depriving him 
of that which is his just due, namely your obedience, your service, the committal of your will to please him is the end of your being. The Bible calls it to love God. When you decide to receive Jesus Christ as God come in the flesh, the one who loved you, who died for you, who rose again, and now wants to rule in your life and invites you to receive him, urges you to take him just as he's presented, Lord and Christ, Prince and Savior. When you so receive him, then something happens. This God in whose presence you live and move and have your being joins himself to your spirit. Why, in a sense, it's like putting the switch on in your television set. The pictures were there all the time, but the break, the gap, kept the flow from occurring. And when you open your heart to receive Jesus Christ, you close the gap. Faith reaches out and closes the gap, and then God begins. And the first the first thing you get on the receiving set of your heart is the broadcast from Calvary. You can call Almighty God Abba, Father. You've been born into His family. Your sins are forgiven. And you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And He comes to bring life. Now, He said that everyone into whom He comes Thus, is going to be a partaker of his nature. Now, you've seen this judgment scene here. You've looked at it. What did you really read? What did the Lord Jesus say in Matthew 25? He said this, I am looking for myself in my people. What? Well, you see, when he saw people hungry, he said, give ye them to eat. He fed them. When he saw people thirsty, he gave them drink. When he saw them as strangers, he took them in. And naked, he clothed them. In sick, he visited them. And in prison, he came to them. And so what he is really saying is this. I am looking for myself in my people. Now, there were two classes of people here. I think they all would have passed the test of orthodoxy, probably were evangelistic in their zeal, missionary in their fervor, being millennial in their hope, devout in their prayer. I think they both would have passed the test. That's why they got to this point. But there was one group in whom Christ found himself. And he was looking for himself. And the ones in whom he thus was and where he found himself these were his people. Now he tells us of another place in Matthew 7 about the people that filled the house. It had the same floor plan. It had the same facade. It had the same material. Everything about the two houses was identical except one was built on sand. One was built on rock. And the two houses stood right there side by side until the judgment came and then one of them fell down. You got the same thing here. You've got two people that have just stood together, and now Christ is looking for himself in his people. You see, when Jesus Christ comes in, he comes in to make us new creatures. And the great judgment that we find is that occasion when Christ is going to expose us to ourselves. He's going to expose us to ourselves. Now, what a tragedy it is to wait until that time to find out, since he's told us precisely what the judgment's going to be. It's going to be a surprise to a lot of people. It shouldn't have been, should it? Because here it is. It's all previewed. It's all set for. So why should you wait to find out in that day, hear him say, away with you, I never knew you? Why? Why wait? Why not just examine your heart today, as Paul commanded, prove your own self, test your faith, knowing that if you are that faith, which is saving faith, heart faith, then Christ is in you, and the evidence is that Christ always is himself wherever he is.
And when he is in you, he is himself. He's himself. Missionaries went out to the Tangali tribe in Nigeria in 1915, Gordon Beecham and John Hall. They went up into the Tangali country and they started to minister. The first one that came to Christ was a young cannibal from the Tangali people, and the second one was a very fierce and feared young man. His father had been killed by the Valeri people, and this young man had lost one eye in a battle with the spears, and his, after his father had been killed by the Valeri people, he'd taken a blood oath in front of the elders of the tribe that he would not rest until he had killed 14 people in of the family, the, of which he found out there were 14 males, and he was going to kill all of them in reprisal for their having killed his father. Now, Tangali was a strange people. No one, no one could marry in the Tangali tribe until he had taken the head of one of the neighboring tribes' people and brought it to the to the father of the girl that he wanted to make his bride to prove his manhood. There were no graves in Tangali land, because when anyone died for any other occasion other than leprosy, in which case they were put in a certain place for the hyenas, but any other place, the Tangali people would go out to the sacred family spirit grove, and there the body would be cut into portions in the sacred part, and the family would eat until it was gone. Then the bones would be put under a cairn of stones as an altar, to which they would make regular sacrifices. And it was into this tribe that the gospel came. Targa came to work as an informant and as a houseboy for the missionaries. One night, when he was sleeping, the Lord Jesus spoke to him and said, Targa, the mothers in Baliri land make their children be quiet at night by saying that if they make a noise, Targa will hear them. They fear you, Karga. Your name strikes fear into the hearts of the Polaris. And now you've come to me, and I've given you, by salvation, I've come into your heart. And Karga, do you think that Polaris should still be afraid of someone into whom I've come? That night, Karga met the Lord Jesus in reference to the blood feud, and the Lord Jesus won. The next morning at daylight, when the station stirred, Carter came out, carrying his, his club, just a, just a staff, and he said to me, I'm on, just a few words, I go to Polyri. Now they thought that somehow in the night a message had come that some of the Polyri people were on the path and he could ambush them and add to this number, this total of those that he had vowed to kill. And the missionary looked at him and said, Oh, Carl, Carl, you're a Christian. You can't go to Baleary. Oh, he said, you don't understand. Last night, Jesus spoke to me, and he told me that the Baleary are still afraid of me, and I must go to the Baleary and tell them they don't need to fear me anymore. And then the missionary said, well, Carter, you can't go to the Bullery, he'll kill you. He said, that's all right. If they kill me, they kill me. But Jesus has said go, and I must go. It was six miles from the station into the edge of the Bullery country, and Carter started out. And he came to the village where the family that had killed his father resided. And here he came, and all of them knew him. Riding down the middle of the way, they were too frightened and surprised to do anything. He walked right up to the compound of the man that had killed his father, and he came in and stood in front of him. And he said, I have come to tell you, you don't need to be afraid of me anymore. And he sat down with them, and he told them what had happened, and how Jesus Christ had come into his heart. That evening he came back, and they said, Will you come back and tell us more about this, Jesus? If he can change someone like you, 
then we should know about him. So every day, when he'd finished his work in the afternoon, Carga would walk the six miles to Bullery, to the compound of the man that had killed his father, and he would sit down with them and tell them about Christ. A year went by, and he one day walked into the mission station, and behind him were nearly 50 of the Bullery people that he had led to the Lord Jesus, and he had prepared for baptism, and they had come to give their testimony to the missionaries, to follow the Lord in baptism, and to be established a church. And after this, which had taken several weeks, had been done, they then said, we must have someone to teach us. You don't need Karga anymore as your houseboy and your informant. We must have him as our pastor. He will come to you when you teach him. Then he will come back to us and tell us what you've taught him. And when he was there years ago, when first I learned of Karga, he had a church of over 1,500 Bulleri people, like himself, all of savage background, and all that he had personally won to praise. He only had 700 in the evening service, because in the afternoon, about 800 of the Bulleri people went out into the other villages and compounds and held little fireside services telling their neighbors and friends and other tribespeople about Jesus Christ. What had happened? Well, you see, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation, a new creature. He's passed from death to life. That's what the apostle is talking about. He's talking about a change. And he said, examine yourself. Christ be in you, except you be reprobate. And at that great judgment, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to look for himself. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. Why? Inasmuch as you did it unto one of the least of these, you did it unto me. What's he saying? He's saying, I am always myself. Whether I am in heaven, whether I am on earth in my ministry, or whether I am at home in the hearts of my people, I'm always myself. Is Christ living in you? What do your family say about you? What do your friends say about you? What do your neighbors say about you? What do they say about me? This is the question we ought to engage us as we prepare for this great judgment. It's not going to take us by surprise. Nothing is going to be sprung on us we don't know about. It's all right here before us. And if you have the kind of insight that I ascribe to you tonight, you pretty well know where you are. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say this. But if tonight were the last night you live, in the morning you stand before Jesus Christ, every one of you know right now whether you hear him say, Enter into the joy of thy Lord, or away from me. I never knew you. Everyone here. I believe in your state of consciousness you know that. Now tonight, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond to the truth you've heard. Some of you have a dead faith, perhaps a dead faith, or a dead faith. And you need to settle this. You need to make sure, and perhaps we can help you, we would certainly want to. I just hope you say, yes, I know that I've been born of God. I know I've passed from death to life. But this indifference has crept over me, this coldness has come, this sin has come into my life, and I must deal with it. I must be right with it. For whatever the need, we're asking you tonight to have your own preview of this judgment. You find out the worst about yourself while it's still time enough to do.